Welcome to part 5 of this week's online lecture. In part 5 we will discuss rotational selection rules. Before we can rationalise all the theory that I've just covered, there is one other thing I have to discuss, which is selection rules. What are the selection rules of this system? Once more, they come about from a consideration of the transition dipole moment. When will the rotational transition moment be non-zero? First of all, the rotational transition moment will only be non-zero if the molecule has a permanent dipole moment. We've already justified that at the beginning of the lecture. Homonuclear diatomics will not interact with an electric field, and so cannot interact with electromagnetic radiation. The second selection rule is that when you see a transition, there is a change in the rotational quantum number, delta j. That change can only be plus or minus 1. It can't be 0, of course, because if delta j equals 0, the rotational state has not changed. But why is it plus or minus 1? There is a semi-classical way of appreciating this that has to do with conservation of angular momentum. Remember, J tells us how much angular momentum the system has. The higher the value of J, the more the angular momentum. A photon has one unit of angular momentum. The thing is, though, that you don't know if it is plus one unit or minus one unit. Why would it be plus or minus? Well, you can think of it as clockwise rotation or anticlockwise rotation. In spectroscopy, we are looking at the interaction of light and matter. In an absorption process, we have a photon being absorbed by a molecule, resulting in a molecule in a higher rotational state. The angular momentum, the angular momentum in this process must be conserved. There must be the same amount of angular momentum before the absorption process as there is after the absorption process. Before absorption, our molecule is in state J, and our photon has one unit of angular momentum. Our molecule absorbs that photon, and so the angular momentum of the molecule can either go up to J plus 1, or go down to J minus 1. The angular momentum must be conserved. The angular momentum of the photon has been transferred to the molecule, so that is the semi-classical way of looking at it. It's not fully accurate, but it can give you an intuitive way of thinking about what is going on. The first selection rule is that the dipole moment mu must be non-zero. So if it is zero, we won't see a microwave spectrum. We call it microwave inactive. Diatomic molecules which do not have a dipole moment are the homonuclear diatomics, such as dinitrogen and dioxygen. Also, of course, symmetrical linear molecules such as carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide doesn't have a permanent dipole moment and will not show a microwave spectrum. So any symmetric molecule such as sulfur hexafluoride and ethene would also be microwave inactive. How do we know if a molecule is going to be microwave inactive? Symmetry tells us. For these molecules here, the molecules have a centre inversion. Any molecule with a centre inversion will be microwave inactive. Therefore, the easiest way to determine whether a molecule is microwave inactive is to determine its point group and see whether its point group contains the centre of inversion operator. If the molecule's point group contains the centre of inversion operator, then that molecule is microwave inactive. So this accounts for our observations 1 and 2. These observations were that a molecule like dioxygen won't have a microwave spectrum, but a molecule like carbon monoxide would have one. And the reason that it does is because it has a permanent dipole moment. I need to reinforce, however, the fact that just because a molecule is microwave inactive, it doesn't mean that it doesn't have rotational levels. Dioxygen molecules and dinitrogen molecules are rotating just like any other molecules. 
They have rotational energy levels just like any other molecules. It's just that microwave radiation cannot excite it from one rotational state to another. The way that it can change its rotational state is that it can collide with other molecules and in exchanging energy can change rotational state. It has rotational levels. The Schrodinger equation will tell us what those levels are, even if we can't see them in spectroscopy. So our selection rule for rotational spectroscopy of diatomics is that delta J is equal to plus or minus 1. This selection rule will enable us to predict the spectrum of a diatomic molecule like carbon monoxide. I know what the energies of the rotational levels are. These energies are given by the rotational term. Because of the selection rule delta J is equal to plus or minus 1, I can excite the molecule from J equals 0 to J equals 1. Similarly, I can excite the molecule from J equals 1 to J equals 2 because again, delta J is equal to plus 1 during this transition. I can do it from J equals 2 to J equals 3, but I can't do it from J equals 0 to J equals 2, and I can't do it from J equals 0 to J equals 3. So only certain transitions are going to be allowed. I'll have, therefore, absorption when I excite the molecule from J equals 0 to J equals 1. I'll also see absorption when I excite the molecule from J equals 1 to J equals 2. I will see a spectral line for every transition from J to J plus 1. I can calculate what the energy is when the molecule is in level J. I can also calculate the energy when it is in level J plus 1. And if I can calculate those two energies and take the difference, that difference should be associated with the frequency of each spectral line in my spectrum. So what is the difference in energy between energy levels for which I can excite a transition? What I need to do is write down the energy in the J plus 1 level and subtract the energy when it is in the J level. So using my expression for the rotational term, this is the difference. The rotational term for the J plus 1 level is B times J plus 1 times J plus 2. You get this simply by substituting J plus 1 into the rotational term expression. The rotational term for the J level is simply B times J times J plus 1. If I expand this expression, I get the following. And after a little bit of rearrangement, I get an energy difference of 2b into j plus 1. So the difference in energy, which is the frequency of the spectral line, will be equal to this expression. Here I'm showing the rotational spectral lines. The rotational energies are given by this expression. If I substitute in for j equals 0, 1, 2, and 3, I get these rotational term energies, 0, 2b, 6b, and 12b, for levels 0, 1, 2, and 3, respectively. The differences between these rotational term energies will be the energies of transitions. We expect to see spectral lines for the transitions marked here because these transitions satisfy the delta J is equal to plus or minus 1 selection rule. Notice that the first spectral line will occur at 2b, this is the smallest energy. The second spectral line will occur at 4b and the third spectral line will occur at 6b. Notice that the spectral lines are going to be 2b apart they are going to be equally spaced. So this is what the spectrum will look like. The difference between any two peaks is equal to 2b. On this axis I'm showing the energies of each of the spectral lines that are generated for the transition from j equals 0 to j equals 1, 
with a transition from j equals 1 to j equals 2, a transition for j equals 2 to j equals 3, and finally for the transition from j equals 3 to j equals 4. The lines are indeed equally spaced. This explains that part of observation 3 that the lines are equally spaced for molecules such as carbon monoxide. We've been able to explain the spectrum of carbon monoxide just by solving the Schrodinger equation. Although this is really quite fascinating, why do we want to do this? It is because it is going to give us structural information about the molecule. Remember, our lines are 2b apart. From the spectrum, we can calculate what b is. And also remember that b is inversely proportional to the moment of inertia, and the moment of inertia is proportional to the bond length squared. So by taking the rotational spectrum, I am able to determine the bond length of the molecule. Spectroscopy can give us a great deal of structural information about a molecule. Have a go at this problem. This is the spectrum I showed earlier, and these are the first few lines of the spectrum. They are very accurately measured. One thing about rotational spectroscopy, it is very accurate in measuring spectral properties. Calculate 2b and calculate the bond length for each of the differences. What you're going to see is that the bond length of each of the differences is not the same as you go through these higher and higher rotational states. In fact, the bond length seems to be getting longer and longer. Why is this happening? Well, our assumption that the bond is rigid is not accurate. It can stretch and go through distortion. And as you go to higher and higher rotational levels, the molecule is rotating faster and faster. Not surprisingly, the bond length gets longer and longer. And so that is what is being exhibited here by the changes in the rotational constant. This is the end of part five of this week's online lecture. Please continue on to part six.